Eric, 1856 to 1881. My mind has touched the farthest horizons of mortal imagination, but reaches ever outward to embrace infinity. There is no knowledge beyond my comprehension, no art or skill upon this entire planet that lies beyond the mastery of my hand. And yet, like Faust, I look in vain, I learn in vain. For as long as I live, no woman will ever look on me in love. Now at last I have found the courage to turn away from the foolish echoes of human gladness, optimism, blind hope, pathetic yearnings. I have let them all go, one by one. And I am as content as I shall ever be on this earth, in my peaceful solitude. My kingdom lies in eternal darkness, Many feet below the level of the Parisian streets outside, shrouded in the chill silence of the grave. Darkness and silence have been my companions since the day I chose to turn my back upon the world of men and create an empire that was solely mine. From the moment of my birth, my destiny was to be alone. But it took me more than forty years to accept that harsh and unrelenting fact to understand where peace and resignation lay. I was not at peace when I arrived in Belgium in the spring of 1856. For three years I had traveled aimlessly once more through Europe, retracing old steps and old haunts like some curious pilgrim, seeking out whatever architectural monuments I had missed as a wandering boy. I would sketch at dawn in the deserted streets and return to my lodgings before the early morning vendors began to sell their wares. And there I would stay, shunning the light of day, until the sun sank beyond the horizon, and it was once more possible f to step out into the poorly lit thoroughfares without exciting instant attention. I was no longer obligated to prostitute my talents in order to eat. The years in Persia had made me wealthy, rich enough to indulge my interests and my increasing aversion to the human race. There was no longer any grim necessity to entertain gawking crowds with the skill of my fingers and the horror of my face. My taste for death, already severely jaded by those grievous excesses in Persia, had been abruptly curdled by an oath which I could not ignore. The deer's voice haunted me all across Asia, making me restless and uneasy in the Orient, where the political assassin is much in demand and the ending of a life all too easily accomplished, with no questions asked. I had learned to control my black and violent moods, first with opium, and later, in Belgium, with morphine. I abandoned an opium pipe for fear of damaging my voice, and in that surge of star-spangled euphoria, the result of my first experiment with a needle, I began work upon the opera that I conceived as my maximum opus. I called it Don Juan Triumphant. It was beginning to grow very cynical. For months I drifted through Belgium, just as I had drifted through the rest of Europe, never staying anywhere long for fear of hostility and reprisal. Antwerp, Ghent, Brussels, and finally learned by the soft, familiar lit of my native language, Tumults, how good it was to hear French spoken everywhere. I had learned many tongues, but nothing compared in my ears with the seductive vowels and the lovely rolling consonants of the most beautiful language in the world. I felt sudden longing to settle in this amenity, civilized land, and build myself a house. The back streets of Mons revealed a man entirely suited to my rather singular needs, susceptible to my voice and willing to do my bidding without asking tiresome questions. A man I could control entirely, simply by exercising my larynx. I had learned by now that such men were to be found in most crowds. Men who turned at my first words to stare with an odd, glazed intensity that appeared to exclude the mask. I had no idea what freak arrangement of my vocal cords enabled me to reduce certain people to a state of trance-like obedience. Regrettably, it is not possible to perform dissections upon oneself. But I regarded my voice as a weapon, as lethal in its way as the Punjab lasso and I never scrupled to use it whenever the opportunity was offered. 
Jules Bernard had completed his apprenticeship as a rough mason, and as soon as I was certain that he would be of use to me, he became my well-paid slave. Handling transactions that had become distasteful to me as I increasingly embraced reclusive habits. Had I been satisfied with my house, our relationship would no doubt have terminated with the placing of the last stone. But long before we reached roof level, I was disillusioned with my design. Jules, instructed to handle the sale on completion of the building, was immediately besieged with half a dozen truly ridiculous offers. Perhaps you might think of contracting, sir, he suggested tentatively. My first impulse was to laugh, and then I paused. Why not? I was still young. I badly needed occupation, even if I no longer needed money, something to take my mind from a composition which was consuming me steadily, from within, like a cancer. Don Juan Triumphant was eating me alive. I need you to lock the score away in a chest now, and forget all the dangerous and unthinkable things it represented to me. Five years later, Jules, then a married man with three small children tumbling around his modest rented quarters, was running a thriving business for me. The service I offered was unique in many ways. It was customary for an architect who had arranged contracts. Not to build himself. It was also customary for an architect to meet his clients, but this I steadfastly refused to do. My terms were so eccentric, it is a wonder the business survived at all. But Jules revealed an unexpected capacity for smoothing the feathers of ruffled customers. It became fashionable to have a house designed and built by the mysterious, elusive architect who merely signed his plans, Eric who had been known to refuse a commission rather than grant a personal compensation. In short, I was, yet again, a very successful novelty, for which the wealthy were prepared to pay quite handsomely. After five years of this existence, I discovered that I was bored to tears building glorified boxes to house fat, complacent businessmen, and their even fatter and more complacent wives. A terrible restlessness was growing steadily upon me, a restlessness that seemed to be compounded partly by frustration and partly by an emotion I simply could not fashion. An urge to return to the land of my birth, which was as primitive and inexplicable as the instinct which drives a salmon to return its native stream. I'm going away for a while, I told Jules abruptly one morning. There is nothing here you can't handle, is there? No, monsieur, he said nervously. Even after all this time, he was not at ease in my presence. Will you be away for long? I cannot say. I would have left the mason's yard without another word, but he suddenly ran after me, almost with panic. Monsieur, at least tell me where you may be reached. I may need you. No one in this world needs me. No one ever will. You will manage, he said quietly. I trust your competence, and it's in your interest to keep this business solvent in my absence. Tell me, have you engaged a tutor for your eldest son yet? Monsieur, he protested, it is beyond my means. You have access to the accounts, I said irritably. Why haven't you taken what you needed? The child is intelligent and deserves to be educated. He should be old enough now to learn and to read and write. See to it without delay. He stared at me in bewilderment. I... I would never steal from you, he stammered. Then you are a fool, I said. You have a fine family. Take whatever you require for their welfare, and there will be no questions asked of you. He was silent for a moment, his long, thin, rather anxious features set into puzzled lines. Again, I made to leave, and a second time he prevented me. Where are you going? he demanded with a sudden touch of fear. I stared past him into the dark street with unseeing eyes. I'm going to Boucherville, I said. I stood at last outside the garden gate of the old house, staring 
remembering. So many times in my imagination had I raised this building to the ground that I was shocked to find it still standing. How dare it stand there in all its quaint, old-worldly charm, housing a family who lived happily unaware of the grief I had suffered behind those ivy-covered walls, the tears I had shed in that attic bedroom, the lonely terror and fear of being shut away from the world forever. I hated this house. I wanted to blow it and all its attendant memories from the face of the earth. I knew now why I had come back to Boisherville. It was to remove this abominable discretion from the landscape of Normandy forever. There was a light burning in an upstairs window, annoying evidence of a peaceful occupation. I could not simply set fire to this building without rousing the wretched inhabitants from their beds. No more murders, I had promised the deer. And even had I not promised, it would still have seemed a mean and shameful wickedness to kill innocent children sleeping in their beds. As I thought of the children, my hand closed around a wad of thousand franc notes. These people would be homeless once I had gratified my morbid urge for destruction, and no one knew better than I the fate that awaited the destitute and the homeless. I would rather drive no French child down the dark paths of decadence which had swallowed my own youth. I was willing to pay generously for this satisfaction. Let them go away and talk for the rest of their lives of the madman who had paid for the privilege of burning their house to the ground. I tethered my white mare to a tree on the opposite side of the road, and she wickered her indignation at finding herself bound. She had carried me across the plains of Asia without a single night spent under such restraint, and for me to deny her freedom now was to abuse the perfect trust that lay between us. Her eyes reapproached me for the insult, but I dared not leave her to wander this free time. Fire is the greatest terror in the world to a horse, and a bolt of panic from her now would almost certainly cost me my life. Taking a pistol from my cloak, I hammered three times on the front door and waited beneath the wooden canopy, secure in the knowledge that I would not be seen from the bedroom windows above. Anyone wishing to satisfy his curiosity would be obliged, obligated to open the door. And since there was not a man on this earth that I could not overpower with my freak strength and my singular knowledge of armed combat, I awaited with a calm that was almost indifference. There was a tub of flowers growing by the front door, and I reached down absently to remove a few strangling weeds that had gained a hold. It always annoyed me to see a fragile bloom struggling for space. A light shadowed suddenly beneath the door, and I heard the familiar sound of the old bolt sliding back. A rash and foolhardy householder, this, who really deserved to die for his stupidity. I stood back in the shadows as the door opened, curious to see how far this incredible recklessness was going to extend. Small wonder the world is full of rogues such as myself and idiots like this invite villainy every day. A candle wavered out over the step, and I froze in horror to find that this careless, ill-advised occupant was a woman I would have recognized anywhere, in spite of the gulf of years that lay between us. And when she turned to look at me with wide, staring eyes and one hand stealing defensively to her throat, her look of aghast recognition was also unmistakable. Holy Virgin, she gasped. Eric! It is strange how the deeply etched habits of childhood emerge from the mind in moments of shock. I found myself automatically giving a stiff little bow, and saying with cool formality, just as I had been taught to say all those years ago, Good evening, Mademoiselle Perrault. I hope I find you well. Both hands flew to her mouth now. She gave a strangled little sob and burst into tears as she gestured wildly for me to follow her into the house. I went with slow, leading heart of dread into the drawing room, but was spared the meeting I now feared above all else. Apart from ourselves, the room was empty. The relief was so immense, disappointment so acute, that I had to sink into the fireside chair for fear of falling. My heart was pounding so wildly, I was afraid she must hear it and I glanced at the brandly decanter on the chiffonier with intense longing. But 
She was too harassed to see my need, and I could not bring myself to commit the gross incivility of asking a lady for spirits. It was bad enough to have sat without invitation in her presence. I gripped my hands on the wooden arms of my chair and struggled for composure. Where is my mother? I asked uneasily. She began to cry harder than ever. You must know where she lives now, I persisted. You need not be afraid. I shall not go there, but I should like to know. Again, with wildly fluttering hands, brushing ineffectively at the grain carroty hair, the familiar quivering lips set in a face that always reminded me of a startled rabbit's. Oh, God, she whispered. I thought you knew. I thought that's why you had come back. Eric, your mother died three days ago. Still, I sat there gripping the chair and wheeling away the threatening veil of darkness. Months I had spent trying to suppress the inexplicably fierce impulse to return here. Drawn by the need to set fire to this house, had I come home, driven by a primitive intuition, merely put to a torch to my mother's funeral pyre? She was here in this house, and she was dead. And all I could think of was the fact that I should now be able to kiss her cold cheek at last, that she would never be able to shrink from my touch again. Perhaps you would like to see her, Marie suggested nervously. I ignored a suggestion which rocked the foundations of my questionable sanity and continued to stare into the fire. Why did she come back? I demanded. She hated this house as much as I did. Why did she come back here, of all the places? Did he die? Was that it? Did he die? Marie looked at me with confusion. Eric, your mother never left this house. I clenched my fists on the chair. Are you telling me that they lived here openly together? That they dared to raise more children beneath this godforsaken roof? They were to go away. I heard him say that. After the marriage, they were to go away where no one knew her. I was shouting now, and Marie's face puckered into folds of extreme distress, but I could not be calm. The thought that I might have half-brothers or sisters here in the very village which had driven me away all those years ago hurt more than I could ever have imagined possible. I could not bear to think what cruel children would have told them of their monstrous sibling. I could not bear to think of their shame and anger, brothers and sisters who had never seen me and yet must have wished me unborn every day of their taunted lives. How dare they stay here? How dared they? The roar of my voice seemed to rattle the old oak beams in the ceiling, and Marie shrank back in terror. There was no marriage, Eric, she stammered. Dr. Bayer went back to Paris a few weeks after you disappeared, and your mother never saw him again. She never remarried. She lived here in the house alone until the last few months of her life when I came to nurse her. I was silenced, numbed, and made utterly hopeless by this terrible revelation. I suddenly saw it had all been for nothing. My flight from this house, and all the horrors that followed as I floundered deeper and deeper into a quagmire of unending, self-perpetuating wickedness. God wanted nothing from the abomination he had created in some careless moment of aberration. Even that childish act of sacrifice was now reduced to a bitter mockery. There was nothing left to separate my soul from those of the eternally damned. And the siblings I had conjured up in panic were just illusions. Just illusions. I had no brother after all. I was quite alone in this empty, echoing world now. There was no remembered tie of blood. Nothing. Nothing. In silence. I rose and went upstairs to my mother's room. Candles burned on either side of the old bees' wax mahogany bedstead, the flames leaping and flickering in draught from the open window. This, then, was the light I had seen from the road outside. 
a light shining in the darkness to lead me home at last. Slowly, very slowly, I turned back to the sheet that covered her and stared incredulously. For the waxen face revealed on the pillow was the face of a stranger, old and altered beyond belief. Time ravages beauty and preserves plainness. I would have known Marie Perrault in any cloud. But this withered woman on the bed, I would have passed in the street without any recognition. Death had made her ugly, shriveled flesh from her cheekbones, and sunk her eyes so deeply beneath her brow that there was now, by some last bitter twist of fate, a real physical resemblance between us. And as I looked at her, I suddenly understood her revulsion at last, because now I shared it. I felt no anger or grief as I looked down upon her. Nothing except a disgust which enabled me to forgive every act of cruelty that she had ever shown me. Yes, I forgave her everything in that moment. But I turned away without touching the hands that lay stiffly folded on her breast. I did not kiss her, now that I had the opportunity. I knew that she would not have wished it, and I no longer felt any desire to do so. Returning to the drawing room, I found Mademoiselle Perrault sitting by the fire with a little sewing lying untended on her lap. I had made the cruel assumption that Mademoiselle was the still the correct form of a dress, and nothing in her sad, dowdy form suggested that I had been mistaken. She got up hurriedly when I entered the room, clutching the material against her withered breast as though it were some kind of shield against my presence. I found I could only admire the noble effort she was making to control her old instinctive terror of me. Even as a small child, I had been aware that she was afraid of me. It used to amuse me to see her twitch with nervousness whenever I came near, and yet, in spite of her timidity, she had always shown me kindness. I remembered her picking silvers of glass from my fingers on the evening of my fifth birthday. And once, a long time before that, I remembered her arguing with me, arguing with my mother, on my behalf. They didn't often argue. No one won arguments with my mother, certainly not Mademoiselle Perrault, who always looked as though she wouldn't know how to say boo to a goose. But that night, she was angry enough to have raised her voice above my mother's, and I, like the obnoxious child that I was, I crept down from the attic to listen outside the closed door. I don't know how you could begin to think of doing such a thing, Madeline. You won't be four until the summer. Oh, for heaven's sake, my mother's had retorted early. I'll be back from Rowan by nightfall. I'll lock him safely in his room with the dog. He'll be all right. He knows how to use a chamber pot, and I'll leave him food and drink. Not that he'll eat it. I don't know why you're making all the fuss. No one's likely to run off with him, for God's sake. Well, I don't think it's right, Madeline. I really don't. A child of that age to be left alone for so many hours? The upshot of this curious conversation was that Mademoiselle Perrault came to look after me for the day while my mother was in Rowan. I remember very well, with my mother's iron hand removed, I proceeded to behave like a perfect little beast. I swung on the curtain rails and frightened her half to death by hanging upside down from the top of the banister. It's a good job we didn't have a chandelier. Don't do that, Eric, dear, she said with a helplessness that only made me swing with more vigor and daring. She always called me Eric, dear, as though it were my given name. I used to think it was very funny and mimic her behind her back, until my mother grew angry and beat me for the impertinence. Please don't do that, Eric. You know your mama would be very cross if she saw you. But mama wasn't there. That was the whole point. Mama wasn't there. And under the timid supervision of this mouse-faced lady, I was suddenly free to do exactly what I wanted. And while she was washing dishes in the kitchen, I went into the drawing room and climbed up to the top of the glass-windowed cabinet. There was a box of chocolates there, a very big box, left over from Christmas. 
I took off the pink ribbon, and Sasha and I ate the lot between us. A little later, Sasha was sick. I was feeling decidedly odd myself by the point by that point, and before I knew what was going to happen, there were two hard brown messes on the beautiful carpet that my mother prized so highly. Sasha at once slunk under the table with her tail between her legs, and I hastily followed her example. I began to cry then, for I knew that when my mother came home I would be beaten for this most heinous crime while Sasha, or poor Sasha, would be put out in the snow in disgrace for the rest of the night. We were still huddled together under the table when Mademoiselle Perel found us. Don't cry, she said kindly, but I was finally persuaded to crawl out from my hiding place. I shall clean everything up, and your mamma need not know nothing of it. I remember staring at her dumbfounded. Aren't you going to tell her? I whispered in disbelief. Aren't you going to tell her how naughty I've been? No, dear, she said, getting down on her hands and knees with a bucket of soapy water. That can be your little secret, can it? Now why don't you be a good boy and find me some old newspapers? I never put another spider on her shawl after that. This nervous, anxious, well-meaning lady had taught me to respect all members of the weaker sex. She had dropped one pearl of purity into my soul, and even now, after all these years, it was still there, displacing a little of the dark, disgusting sludge of depravity. I had done many terrible things, but I had never harmed a helpless woman. Not all women were helpless, of course. There was the canoe. God knows she came closer to Allah in my presence than she ever guessed one more than one occasion. I suppose my senses were deceiving me, but there were times where I honestly began to wonder what that bitch really wanted from me. Times when I almost believed. But <laughs> that is absurd. I flattered myself. And yet, perhaps there really are women like Javert with a taste for the bizarre and the obscene. I often wondered what it would have been like to bury myself in all that warm, pulsating wickedness prior to killing her. But, by and large, there were unworthy prey. Women. Fragile creatures who already seemed created to endure too much suffering. Cruel husbands, childbirth, and early death. And it's really very difficult to kill someone when all your inner instincts would oblige you to take off your half first. Are you still afraid of spiders, mademoiselle? I demanded suddenly. Oh, yes. She gave a nervous little laugh and nudged away from me nearer the hearth. Such a silly, childish thing, was it not? Your mother never had any patience with me over it. Oh, dear. I should have been prepared for this, after all. I placed an advertisement in the press as soon as I realized that that she did not have very long. I hoped against hope that you would see it, but it seemed such an unlikely chance, after all these years even allowing for the circulation of the press. After all, we did not even know if you were still in France, let alone Paris. She often spoke of you, Eric. I turned away abruptly. Did she think me a child still to be comforted by sense of fantasies and pretty lies? My mother had hated and feared me. I pretend now that it had been otherwise. When is the funeral? I asked harshly. Tomorrow, Marie whispered. There won't be many mourners. Just a few acquaintances that she made after... Well, after... She spread her hands helplessly, and I nodded curtly to signify my understanding. I think perhaps it would not be wise. I have no intention of attending the event, I assured her. And hardened though I was, her palpable relief hurt me. I did not need to be told what scandalized horror would attend my presence in the graveyard. The last service I could render to my mother was to allow her to be laid to rest with dignity that had been so dear to her. At least I could play my requiem for her. Sitting down at the old piano, I quickly lost myself in music 
my fingers caressing the keyboard with ecstasy. Music was the secret sanctuary of my soul. Music was my god, the only master I would ever serve again. I wished I could build a monument to its glory, a shrine where I could worship and revere. It would be a fitting act of homage to raise a mausoleum dedicated to the splendors of harmony and lyric, a wonderful fusion of my deepest creative urges. Something vast and resplendent, something on a scale never before conceived, an opera house, perhaps. My mother had often spoken of the need for a definitive Parisian opera house. Like most people who have failed to realize a childhood's ambition, she had considered herself something of an authority on the subject, and certainly public interest in a permanent opera house for the capital dated back over a hundred years. More people than my mother had felt heatedly on the subject, and Professor Gazot's strong opinions on optimal location and audition shape had informed me much of my studies under his guidance. Delighted by my natural interest in his pet obsession, I had learned to love opera at a very early age. He had consequently directed me from the works of Blondel to those of Chaumont, Damoun, Pat, and Dumont. Those last months before I ran away, I was so deludged by contradictory matter material that I am sure that even then I could have put together a reasonably lucid exposition on the need for a topologically expressive exterior. I had never been to Paris, but the professor had shown me extensive street plans and one and once amused me by entering a furious dispute with my mother over the relative sight merits of the Pla Place de la Concorde over the Bois de Moulins. I remember that he was well and truly routed by my mother's passionate indignation. Ladies, he told me later, polishing his steamy glasses when he, when we were alone once more in the dining room. Are regrettably incapable of arguing a point without resorting to emotion. You may take it from me, Eric, that the Bois de Moulin offer a very far superior situation. Arrogant man, snapped my mother when the professor had gone. The Bois de Moulin will never be, will never in a thousand years be considered an elegant quarter of Paris. It would be another social travesty to build there. The Place de la Concorde is the obvious solution. Personally, I had considered they were both wrong, but I was far too well brought up to say so at the time. I would have placed the opera in the very center of Paris. I befitted a great monument which would inevitably become the social hub of the city. The Boulevard de Capucine seemed to me the most obvious place, but no doubt the arguments would go on for another fifty years before a decision was finally made. I became aware of Marie hovering uneasily at my side, and I stopped playing abruptly. Don't stop, she said quietly. That requiem is your own composition, is it not? Your mother would have dearly loved to hear it played, I sneered. Mademoiselle, I outgrew my need for fairy tales many years ago. Suddenly Marie rushed to the cabinet in the corner of the room and began to pull out sheets of my old childish designs. There was never a day when she didn't think of you, Eric. Look, do you see? She kept everything. Everything that reminded her of you. I stared at the papers tumbling out on the floor. They proved nothing to me except that my mother was a notorious hoarder who could throw out nothing away. We had lived entirely surrounded by relics of the past. Grandfather's architectural library, grandmother's English jewelry. Looking at the hearth now, I could see a stack of newspapers that must be many weeks old. Marie was fretting in the drawers, bringing out a wad of legal-looking documents, which she thrust into my hands. The deeds of the house, details of your grandfather's stock investments, she explained feverishly. They were all to be left for you in a bank vault in Rouen. It's there in her will, if you don't believe me. Guilt, I thought, with a flicker of remorse for my heartlessness. Guilt is surely the saddest of all human emotions. 
but guilt is not love. It is a fire that consumes without giving warmth to those embraced in its tangled corners. Poor mother. Wordlessly, I gathered up my old musical scores and designs and threw them on the fire. Then, while Marie stood with her handkerchief pressed against her mouth, I bent mechanically to gather up the newspapers and send them the same way. I never read newspapers. I had no interest in the present. Only past. And the future excited my imagination these days. The antics of the Empress and Genu were no concern of mine. My God, some of these papers were six months old and turning yellow. But one was recent enough. 30th of May, 1861. My eyes were drawn inexorably to the leading story. Garnier wins commission for Paris Opera House. I stood up with the paper in my hand, devouring the article with numbed outrage. Charles Garnier, age 36, winner of the public com competition held for the design of the new Paris Opera. Public competition. I wheeled around on Marie. What do you know of this? I demanded, taking an aggressive step toward her. What do you know of it? She didn't know much, but it was sufficient to supplement the, the article and fuel my uncontainable fury. Architects, both professional and amateur, had been required to submit their designs anonymously in that competition. Their names and address in a sealed envelope. I crumpled the newspaper in my hand and walked away from her quickly before my hands fastened around her neck in sheer, ungovernable frustration. The initial round of the competition had opened in December, and it had been December when I was first struck with that devastating feeling of restlessness and ease. Lacking the means to interpret my premonition, intuition, whatever it was, I had let precious months lie by, because my own supreme indifference to the affairs of men prevented me from purchasing something as simple as a newspaper. I had lost my only chance of circumventing the strict, hierarchical system that normally governed public architectural appointments in France. I had lost by default to a young, barely known architect, a previous winner of the Grand Prix de Rome. It was too late to design the shrine to my own one pure and unsullied love. I had betrayed my music, and betrayed it by the worst of all human crimes, uninformed ignorance. The urge to kill became so strong that I thought I should die of it. Garnier, Charles Garnier, I'm very glad of the miles that separate us tonight. The terrible silence in the room was punctuated by my ragged breathing and Marie's gasping terror. She was white with fear when I turned to look at her, and immediately I was ashamed. This poor, pitiful little woman deserved only kindness at my hands. I must be calm. I must channel this fury and turn my unseemly thoughts away from murder in this house of death. I must remember my promise. An hour passed according to the clock on the mantelpiece, an hour in which I did nothing except sit staring into the dying fire. Calmness returned to me at length in the wake of resignation and new resolve. I accepted that it was too late to create the original design, but it was not too late to stand on the site at which this great mausoleum rise beneath the guidance of my own hands. It was not too late to build. I left the old house in Boisherville shortly before dawn, leaving my mother's body in the care of her faithful friend. Marie would keep the keys to the house and await my instructions. I trusted her discretion implicitly. I left without returning to look at one last time upon my mother's dead and unlovely face. The beautiful features, delicate as a butterfly's wing, were buried safely in the mists of my memory. I could not wipe them from my mind, but there was a certain comfort in knowing that I would never see that face resurrected. She had never existed for me outside an illusion. She had never existed, and now, at last, I could forget her forever. Paris was another shock for which I was totally unprepared. The romantic old city which I had once explored as a wide-eyed fugitive boy, the very great Paris of Voltaire and Desmoulins, was being swept into oblivion beneath the hands of the emperor and his grand, perfect Baron Hussman. As I made my way back from the demolished site of the new opera in the grayish first light of day, it seemed to me that everything eccentric, artistic, and historic was being relentlessly destroyed beneath the imperial drag 
A wide open space is a uniformity. When I looked at the impersonal apartment blocks that were beginning to line the wide boulevards, a monument to the Emperor's vulgarity, materialism, and rampant bad taste, there was a moment when I considered death to kind of fate for these tyrannical authors of destruction. There had been much at fault in the old Paris, but it never deserved to be gutted so mercilessly. Beautiful buildings torn down for no better reason than that they simply stood in the way of progress. This was murder, rape, and a wholesale pillage on a scale beyond imagination. The soul of the city had been bled white by a heartless and insensitive decimation. The road to the edge of the city, to the new slums where the impoverished had been driven by high rents in the wake of the Osman's ruthless sweep of rebuilding. Many of the Parisian poor were homeless now, wandering the streets like Arab nomads in search of property within their means. Saw children sleeping in the gutters, wrapped in old newspapers, and my blood boiled at the sight of such cruel injustice. It was here among the poor that I found lodgings. I had the means to stay in the finest hotel suites in Paris, but I instinctively shed away from the rejection of the well-bred and the wealthy, the looks of suspicious distaste which always preceded the information that a particular hotel room or a tasteful apartment was not available. Not available to me. It was what they meant, of course. A man in a mask must inevitably had some social stigma to hide. The poor were less particular as long as one could pay. But even so, three landlords shut their doors hurriedly in my face before I found a man greedy enough to overcome his distinctive fear of me. I paid the extortionate amount he required for hot water, and when I had bathed, I sat down and wrote a letter that would bring Jules Bernard from Belgium. His honest, well-dressed person, coupled with my money, would acquire me lodgings in a more salubrious area for a time, until the inevitable hounding and extortion forced me to move on. For the past five years I had acquired all my lodgings for me, and I was gallied by an increasing dependence upon him, my growing inability to outface the stairs of tailors and shoemakers. Whatever I required now, Jules obtained for me, everything from shirts to morphine. In Russia and the Orient, it had been possible to go about my business with some degree of freedom. But here in the Mecca of the civilized world, where everything was so respectable, I felt increasingly like a hunted spider, hiding in a web. I was rapidly losing the buoyancy and optimism of youth. I knew that I would starve now, rather than sing or display myself in any way before a crowd. I preferred to work in the dark of these days, unseen and unheard. And for that, I needed jewels. I knew that he would come immediately upon receipt of my letter, simply because he dared not refuse. And as soon as he came, I would set him to work. Six weeks later, I had everything I needed. For a respectable man, Jules had turned out to be the most accomplished spy. I knew all that I needed to know about Garnier and his designs, and I had in my employ some of the best stonemasons in the region. Once Jules had passed the world in the right quarters, human greed brought the men one by one to my door to face my harsh and exacting scrutiny. I was prepared to pay for the best, and I rejected ruthlessly until I found it. On first night, sight of Garnier's plans, my instinct had been to abandon the whole project and return to Belgium at once, for the exterior design filled me with despair. I saw at once that the Paris Opera would be ugly and unoriginal, as squat and unlovely as a huge toad planted on the bleak new Parisian landscape. I particularly disliked the colonnaded loggia across the face of the building. The whole concept was vulgar, not to say profane, and yet, and yet it was grandos, conceived on a scale of breathtaking amb ambition that brought me back to the plans again and again. It would dwarf the palace of Mesidarian with its three acres sight. Seventeen floors and five cells below street level. His building, with its fireproof girders and many modern refinements, was reaching out to the future and represented a truly monstrous feat of engineering. Since it seemed that Garnier's gross and forbidding child must indeed come into the world, then I intended to preside over a birth 
which would independently prove difficult and protective. It is possible to love an only child, if you have tended it for long enough, nursed it through danger, and buried yourself in its future. In time, that Lugia would seem no worse to me than an unfortunate birthmark. A sad blemish that would fill me with loving pity and make me long to protect the unfortunate building from the comments of its cruel critics. It would be beautiful inside, with its magnificent grand esculer, its marbled columns, mural foyers, and chandeliers. It would be beautiful inside. When I had completed the estimate for the stonework, I wrote directly to Garnier. I knew a lot about him by now. Born in the notorious Rue Moffatard, one of the worst slums in Paris, son of a blacksmith with social aspirations, he had only escaped his appointed place in his father's business because he proved physically incapable of working the huge bellows. A nervous, delicate, gifted man, he had clawed his way in the middle of classes through his own restless industry and determination, and now resided with his young wife in the Boulevard Saint Germain. Excitable and eccentric, the man possessed the imagination of a true artistic genius, and I knew he would see me, if nothing else. No true artist could have resisted the provocative flattery of my outrageous proposal. Garnier indicated a chair on the opposite side of his untidy desk, and turned down the gas lamp in accordance with my request. He was surprised by the mask. He gave no sign of it, as he sat back and studied me calmly in the half-light pressing the tips of his fingers together, like a church steeple. Let me make one thing perfectly clear from the outset, monsieur, he said with an aggression that rather amused me. I have asked you here tonight purely out of interest. Your proposals were so utterly unorthodox that I, I confess I could not resist the opportunity of meeting the author of such colossal impertinence. May I ask what makes you think I would accede to bribery? I raised my shoulder in a careless shrug. Every man has his price. You are, if I may say so without giving offense, relatively unknown in your chosen field, and the government has naturally taken advantage of that fact in the matter of your rumination sat upright in his chair suddenly. Meaning? He chanted softly. Meaning that while it is usual for a public architect to have his fees set at 3% of expenditure, I understand yours have been fixed at 2. Why would you feel morally beholden to a government which intends to cheat you from the very outset? And you must know what will inevitably happen. Every time you run over budget, you will face accusations of artificially inflating expenditure in order to increase your architectural fees. You will be comfortable, of course, very much more comfortable than you have been up till now on your annual 8,000 francs as a city architect. But you may rest assured, monsieur, that the government of this land has absolutely no intention of making you a millionaire in return for the work of a lifetime. And you will be an old man by the time this building is completed. He laughed suddenly. I'm only thirty-six, my friend. How long do you think it's going to take me to complete this work? If it took ten years, which, God forbid, I should hardly be in my dotage. I smiled and seen behind the mask. If you finish it in ten, which you won't, you will still be broken in spirit and help from doing battle every waking hour of every day with G's pairing bureaucracy and thieving contractors. You will be a physical wreck before they're done with you, Garnier. You're just too naive to know it yet. So be sensible and accept my compensation. I offer you the opportunity to feather a comfortable little nest of your own. Is there nothing you want to build for yourself and your wife? Frowned. Pushed back in his chair with an irritable gesture and got to his feet restlessly. A small fellow, physically unimposing, he carried himself with a certain arrogance that began to trouble me. This man was proud of his humble origins, proud enough to have defiantly settled within fifteen minutes. Walk of the slum in which he had been born. Was it really true that everyone had their price? 
Suppose my moral objections forbid me to take this money for my own use, he said suddenly. I shrugged and prepared to alter track a little. But you receive demands ad nauseum to use fewer men and cheaper materials at every stage of construction. You may find it useful to have a little extra funding that the government knows nothing about. He nodded, as though that was something he could better accept. You have submitted two estimates with widely different figures, he continued. Perhaps you would care to explain your purpose in that? I sighed. It was tedious to be obliged to spell out every little last detail, and I did not for one moment believe he was as simple as he was trying to make out. The higher estimate is for the ministry. The lower represents true fee that I would accept to receive. He looked at me in some astonishment. Those figures are quite untenable, he protested. You would have to be operating at a loss to keep them. Do you usually work for nothing, monsieur? Only when it amuses me to do so. I am a wealthy man, Garnier. You need have no doubt of my ability to finance this little indulgence of mine, or to purchase your goodwill in that matter. This is a government project, he pointed out sternly. You must realize... There are correct channels of procedure that will blind me hand and foot. I laughed. There are few things on this planet more open to corrupt practice than a government project. I could hide for many years in the paperwork generated for the Ministry of Fine Arts. The final choice of contractors will be yours. He came out from behind the desk and stood over me. I don't think contracting is your normal line of business. You are an architect, aren't you? Again, I smiled grimly behind the mask. This man was no fool. What had he guessed? My competence extends to many fields, I said coolly. For a moment, I choose to contract. There is no question of professional rivalry between us. But there could have been, he persisted shrewdly. I think I am correct in assuming that, am I not? I declined to answer him, and my hands clenched automatically on the arms of the chair. The old claustrophobic sensation of caged bars closed in around me, and I suddenly knew I had been a fool to come here tonight. I had been terribly mistaken. This man was as honest as the day was long. What in God's name had me had made me think that I could get away with such an outrageous madness? I'm sorry to have wasted your time, I said grimly, getting to my feet. Forget this happened. Forget you ever saw me. I shall not be troubled. I shall not trouble you again. One moment. He was staring at the mask with a sudden intense interest that made me deeply uneasy. Please sit down again, he continued with new cordiality in his voice. I would like you to see something. I sank into the chair with a terrible feeling of foreboding. Not since the day I woke up in that gypsy cage had I ever felt quite so deeply trapped. I realized with horror that it might be necessary to kill him now in order to escape my own arrogant stupidity. But his wife was in the apartment. She had opened the door to me and I had seen her suck in a startled breath before she collected herself sufficiently to direct me to her husband's study. What on earth should I do if she started to scream? I was a fool. An unmistakable fool. When would I ever learn to keep away from people? From the file in the bottom drawer of his desk, Garnier extracted a handful of papers and passed them to me. I think you will recognize these, he said. He stared at the papers in my hand with disbelief. How did you get a hold of them? I demanded passionately. How? He did not answer for a moment. I watched him cross the room and return with two glasses of brandy, giving me one. He sat upon the edge of the desk and took a sip from his own glass. He curiously arranged features betraying a certain repressed excitement. I had a tutor at the School of Fine Arts, 
he began conversationally. An elderly, rather eccentric fellow who took an interest in promising students. He was a good-natured old man, very interesting in his own way, had a stock of good stories to tell. If you had the patience to bear with his rambling. Before he died, he entrusted me with these papers, asked me to keep them safe, told me that if I ever had the, for the good fortune to come across the man who drew them, I would have the honor of knowing the greatest architect in the history of the world. I always thought it was a pretty tale, an old man's fantasy. How old were you when you designed these buildings, Eric? Seven, eight? I let the papers fall on my lap. For a moment, all I could see was my cheerful, pompous, opinionated tutor lying silent forever. His visits had been the light of my childhood, before it was boarded up. I had stood at the attic window for hours on end, waiting for that first glimpse of his carriage, which would send me running down the stairs in wild excitement to the front door. What else did he tell you besides my name? I muttered at last. Sufficient for me to understand why you wear that mask, said Garnier slowly, with the air of a man choosing his words now with some care. Sufficient to make me thankful that you never entered the ministry's competition. I glanced up at him in resentful surprise. What makes you so damn sure I didn't enter? He spread his hands in what I later learned was a rare gesture of self-deprecation. If you had, he said, I should still be earning that miserable 8,000 francs a year. It was too late to acquire the contract for the excavations, but Garnier made surreptitious agreements for my presence on the site in spite of this. He had offered me a position in the new Agnes, which would have given me the opportunity to work on the definitive designs, but after a few nights of agonized indecision, common sense obliged me to decline. To be imprisoned in the draftsman's office, surrounded by nineteen well-educated young men, most of whom had been students at the School of Fine Arts, was an ordeal I simply lacked the courage to face. Awkward sciences, putative whispers, staring eyes. There would be no escape from my terrible difference in such a closely confined environment. And I knew that as soon as I got my hands on those thing, those designs, I would inevitably cause friction and ill feeling. I would be unable to stay silent, and the result of my outburst would be an uncontrollable violence that could only end in murder. It was better to stay away from temptation rather than let my evil temper put an end to my dream. But Garnier did not press me to accept. I'd like to think that perhaps he understood. I don't know what he said to the excavating contractor, but the man always treated me with rare respect, as though he believed my ubiquitous presence on the site to have some official capacity, whether he thought me as an inspecteur, a sous inspecteur, or a designateur, was never entirely clear. But he never argued with any of my suggestions, and he was always careful to call me sir. And so, I was there when things started to go drastically wrong. Excavating in the area of the cove, the sub-stage section of the building, which descended twelve meters below ground, they hit water. What the devil is it? muttered Garnier. My abrupt message had brought him rushing to the site, and he was now peering down into the collapsing footings in undisguised dismay, his collar parting company with his shirt and evidence of his hasty toilette. A subterranean tributary of the Sien, by the look of it, I said grimly. I'd say it cuts through this entire area. Garnier raked one hand through his untidy black curls. Christ, of all the things, all the places. I nodded. They can do no more unless the water table is lowered. He let out a colorful splendid of which common decency forbids me to record. Have you any idea what that would entail? He said furiously. 
I'm afraid I know exactly what it's going to entail. Pulling a paper from my sleeve, I handed it to him. He studied it for a while and then looked up incredulously. You are actually suggesting that I create an artificial lake beneath the stage? You really don't have much of a choice, I explained patiently. You can evacuate the water during the course of construction with steam pumps as described, but that double casing is the only means of controlling the river's flow and permanently protecting the foundations from erosion. Of course, you will have to steal you have to seal with bitumen to resist seepage, but that shouldn't present a problem. And the cost? he said warily. I shrugged. Submit the figures you think you can get out of the ministry. I will take care of any shortcoming. You must be utterly mad, he sighed. I didn't contest that remark. Merely spread my hands in a philosophical gesture. My only concern is that the work should go ahead without delay. I can't lay a single stone until these excavations are completed, and I'm not by nature a patient man, as you will learn. Pulling the paper, he placed it carefully in the pocket of his overcoat. Nothing stands in your way for long, does it? He mused, looking back at me thoughtfully over his shoulder. Why do I have the strange feeling that opposing your wishes could prove very prejudicial to a man's health? I smiled faintly. I would never advise any man to ignore his deepest instincts, Garnier. That sounds uncommonly like a threat, he frowned. I rarely make I rarely waste time making threats, I said calmly. And before he could reply to that, I walked across the quagmire of mud to signify that our conversation was at an end. Eight giant steam pumps worked night and day for eight months to drain the saturated subsoil. The Parisians were driven insane by the incessant pounding. I had a certain grim sympathy with their discomfort, for I suffered as much as anyone else from the rhythmic thumping, which seemed to echo in my head long after I left the site at night. I had no need to be there, of course. This was not my contract, and yet I found I could not keep away. In January 1862, the concrete foundations were poured, and as soon as the first section was cast, I began work on the masonry substructure. The outer world ceased to exist for me at that point. Time no longer had any meaning. I was only vaguely aware of Garnier's trails, his bitter and protracted struggle with the government against the demands for more stricken economy. But each time I saw him, he looked paler and more harassed. I listened to his furious complaints with guarded sympathy and counted myself well out of that particular arena. God knows he refrained from shedding blood at some point in those first nine years. Nine years! Is it really possible to let nine years slide away almost without noticing the change of the seasons? I had never been so utterly absorbed, so blissfully unaware of frustration. On a site that size of this, it was possible to largely avoid association with the other contractors, but I had already taken the precaution of creating my own secret places deep in the vaults of the foundations. A device, set into the double case well beneath the substage area, folded me a place of darkness and privacy to which I might retire whenever I was angered to the point of violence by idleness, corruption, or pure stupidity. It served me well on many occasions. In the whole course of those nine years, not a single workman died by my hand, and I began to wonder if I had conquered the need to kill after all. I drove my men hard, hard enough, I dare say, to have earned a dagger in the back more than once. The distinction of receiving the highest wages on the site was doubtless the only incentive they had to bear with my tyranny. It had to be fear that made them obey my instructions with such prompt alacrity. Fear and sheer financial dependence. I wasn't stupid enough to believe it could ever be done anything else. The opera house swallowed my life whole. I arrived at the site before dawn, seldom leaving before midnight, and as the years passed, I found it increasingly difficult to leave at all. 
When the harsh winters forced a halt in masonry work during January and February, for fear of freezing temperatures, I continued to haunt the, right, the rising building like a lost soul, often disappearing into the vaults of the theater to make strange altercations whose purpose I could hardly explain even to myself. Secret ways which no one need ever know about. Invisible trap doors. There was an intense satisfaction in leaving my unseen mark upon this building, which I can only suppose was a fixation of my disordered mind. There seemed to be no other explanation for what, even in my own eyes, I was exceedingly odd behavior. My life was measured out in meters, and each meter was a mental milestone. A little thrill of achievement. As I watched these awesome mausoleum reach toward the sky, monolithic revier, limestone shafts for the main facade, sixteen columns of red jura stone, twelve of rose granite, thirty of several column marble. There was no end to the wonder of touch that now lay beneath my fingers, and I wandered through the edifice at each night, like the Shah in his harem, bestowing my caresses with very impartiality. At least one lovely column should feel jealous or neglected. I was glutted with beauty, sated and contented by excess beyond my wildest dreams. The sight of the giant Corinthian columns that supported the arches of the auditorium dome made me feel like a druid priest at Stonehenge. Garnier, on the other hand, must by now have felt like the sacrificial sheep on the block. Year by year, my pity for the man grew stronger as he battled through personal tragedy, the death of his only child being swiftly followed by the death of his father, fought like a stag at bay to preserve the integrity of his dream. Twice in succession, the government axed a million francs from the opera's credit budget. By March 67, the project was 500,000 francs in debt, and Garnier was at his wit's end. You were right. He told me in despair one evening. Right in all you predicted, you should have trained as a gladiator, not an architect. I don't suppose you have too many francs about you, do you, Eric? I laughed and accepted the hip flask of brandy which he offered to me. Not the first he had downed this evening by the look of him, poor devil. Not by a long way. If I had, you should have it gladly, I said. Yes, I know, he sighed screwing the top back on his flask with unsteady fingers. Why aren't you the Emperor, Eric? Why the hell aren't you the Emperor? I can only assume that he was too drunk to know what he was doing. For I, for as I assisted him out of the dark and silent building before he broke his neck on the dangerous construction debris, he suddenly flung one arm around my shoulder with rough commodity. If they ever make you the Emperor, he said aggressively, I'll be the first one out in the street throwing my bloody cap in the air. I got him a cab, since he was clearly too far gone to get home alone in any safety, and he wrung my hand hard for a moment before getting in and something back on the seat. You have made a damned good emperor, he said in modeled in tones. Do you know that, Eric? A damned good emperor. Yes. He did not normally indulge, but he was very, very drunk that night. I very much doubted that he ever remembered what he said that evening, let alone who it was who had put him in the cab. A guard of respect had grown up between us over the years, preventing the clash of our violated personalities, which on first glance might have seemed inevitable. Garnier had a truly spectacular temper when roused, and the restraint he managed to employ when dealing with government idiots never ceased to amaze me. He didn't care what he did to keep life blood throwing through the opera coffers. He would thump a war drum or grovel like a spaniel. Whatever was required. And I admired that more than I could say. I, too, would have fought like a tiger. But I would not have begged. My stiff-necked pride would have been the cord which strangled the opera in its birth canal. We were astonishingly patient with each other, as though we both understood what it was to own minds that were ceaselessly and painfully awake. We shared a rage for perfection and imagination that was in constant ferment. 
And so that third evening in September 1870, when you came to the opera and found me working alone without the mask, I felt curiously calm and indifferent toward a discovery which would normally have filled me with mortified fury. He looked at me with shocked surprise, but he had the grace not to stare, and I felt I could forgive him that first moment of paralyzed wonder. To be perfectly honest, he was no oil painting himself. I had seen his singular features rather unkindly caricatured in the popular press more than once. The angular face ravaged with lines of worry and intermittent ill health. The eyes deep set beneath a curious flattened skull. Perhaps it helped that he was ugly. Perhaps I was simply too exhausted for violence. But, at any rate, I felt no inclination to kill him for this outrage. He came calmly across the scaffolding that surrounded the inner auditorium cupola structure and examined the area on which I was working with approval. I don't know how you can see in the abysmal light, he remarked pleasantly. You must have the eyes of a cat. I said nothing. He was dressed for dinner, and no doubt his wife, Louise, was fuming in their carriage at this very moment, waiting to go home. Surely he would not linger now. I am building an opera house, he said quietly. You, on the other hand, my friend, seem quite determined to turn it into a tomb. I turned to look at him in surprise, and he spread his hands in an expressive Gallic gesture. Your men say that you are killing yourself. I laughed harshly. You mean they hope I'm killing myself. He shook his head slowly. My little Bernard fellow is very anxious. He begged me this morning to speak to you because he dared not do it himself. Jules frowned as I considered this unexpected information. The man had seven children now to feed and educate. Madame Bernard seemed to conceive every time her husband hung up his trousers. On reflection, I suppose it was perfectly natural that the man should be anxious about the source of his livelihood. Surely, he hadn't dared to tell Garnier about the morphine. Twenty hours a day, continued Garnier slowly. Have you no home to go to, Eric? Still, I was silent, thinking of the dozen apartments Jules had rented for me since I began work on the opera. Each time, the pattern had been similar. First, the anonymous, abusive letters, and the wanton, unprovoked damage, and finally the aggressive blow or nervous tap at the proprietor upon my door. Please and try to understand, monsieur. The other tenants have begun to complain. I never argued or protested. Simply left with weary resignation before the violence began. I already saw there was no point in purchasing a property at husband's wildly inflated prices. It would not solve my predicament, and besides, I needed to husband my resources. My financial commitments were considerable, and my capital was dwindling rapidly. I was no longer the enormously wealthy man that I had been ten years ago. The opera and Jules' rapidly increasing family of hungry, ignorant little rabbits had seen to that. Each time I was hounded from a flat, my next residence was in an area a little less elegant, a little less respectable, until I found myself once more on the edge of the city among the very poor. With consequence, I had begun to work longer and longer hours at the opera, dreading the moment when I should have to return to those dingy and dangerous streets. The opera is my home, I observed with a flippancy that did not quite conceal the grin of truth in my statement. Garnier looked at me steadily, and there was an odd sort of pity in his dark eyes. Not for much longer, I'm afraid, he said. Nine years of self-restraint exploded in my head like a barrel of gunpowder. In a moment, I had him by the throat, and we lurched dangerously close to the edge of the scaffolding. What are you talking about? I snarled. You gave me your word. I should finish this work. You wouldn't go back on it now. I live. I promise you. I flung him to the plank flooring, and there he remained a moment, tenderly fingering his neck. There is no need for such violent anger, he said quietly. 
I assure you, this has nothing whatsoever to do with me. What then? I demanded rudely. Explain yourself. He sighed and sat back on his heels, brushing the white dust from his immaculate black trousers. I suppose you are aware that we're at war with Prussia? Of course I'm aware of it, you idiot. Who isn't? He gave a little shrug. Sometimes I feel you're not quite in the same world as the rest of us. Talk is all over Paris that the Emperor surrendered to Sudan yesterday. The public fury at his failure is almost uncontainable. The boulevards are full of crowds shouting, Down with the Empire! Can't you hear the war outside? They say there will be another revolution in the next 24 hours. The Emperor was a very sick man, I said grimly. They had no business to send him out to war, as they did when he could barely sit on a horse. Garnier glanced at me with surprise. He must be the only man in France who remembers that now. There's no compassion in the streets today. There never is, I said, and turned back to my work. Eric, there is something more. Yes. I did not bother to look around. They say the German's army is preparing to march on Paris. Do you know what a siege will mean? A lot of children will starve, I said darkly. It was always the children who suffered. The children and the animals. Yes, yes, said Garnier with a touch of impatience. But have you thought of what it will mean for us? For the opera? Swung around in horror, and again he spread his hands helplessly. It's a government building, and will be repositioned for the war effort. All work will automatically be suspended for an indefinite period. God knows when we will be able to work again, or even if the building will survive the German shells. Eric, do you understand what I'm saying? I understood. I understood that men, rash, stupid, mindless men, were about to take my sacred trust away from me. Paris would be shelled by Bismarck's great German war machine, and nine years of ceaseless labor might be ruined in as many seconds. I picked up the mask and swung down from the scaffold and stood in silence. Eric! Garnier shouted in alarm, peering after me in the poor light of my lanterns. Where are you going? As far away from men as I can get, I spat viciously. There was only one way for me to go now, and that was down, 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 into the bottomless dark reaches where no one went now, down the endless flights of stone stairs to the fifth basement, and my secret place beyond the lake. When the great stone closed behind me, shutting me in the cavernous expanse of the foundation's double casing, my single candle lit a moment of stunning revelation. I suddenly realized that I had spent my entire life searching for one place where I would feel at peace, somewhere to rest in safety from prying eyes. Once I had known such a place. That first year I had spent in Giovanni's cellar, nestled snugly like a young animal in its nest. I touched a security and happiness that I had been unable to find again, no matter where I wandered. As long as Giovanni was there above me, like God in his heaven, I knew that I was safe. Boys all over the world learn to call their father sir. It is a mark of respect which in no way denies affection. But in my heart he was always father, always. Until the day that Luciana came and broke my life in little pieces. I closed my mind against him. The pain was more than twenty-five years old. It was weak and contemptible to be unmanned by it yet again. They were both dead and gone. Get them. Let them go. And yet, I found now that I was remembering that cellar with desperate yearning. Surely it would be possible to recapture that sense of well-being and contentment if only I could recreate the environment in which I had first experienced those alien and elusive feelings. If I made a nest of my own deep beneath the Parisian streets, no one need ever find me again. There would be no sniggering, no ugly shouts, no stones thrown in, no knives drawn. 
there would be no one. Yes, that was the true revelation. The sudden understanding that I no longer wanted anyone, that I was weary of struggling to exist in a world where I could never belong. I had spent the best part of four years banging my head against the walls of reality till I was bloody and bemused by my failure. What a fool I had been, when the answer was here all that time. A quiet, dark place waited to embrace me. All I had to do was what any sensible spider would have done many years ago, scuttle inside to safety and stay there. As I lit more candles and began to explore like an excited child, fantasies unwound in my head like a spool of golden thread. My house would be of a regular shape, but it could spread as far as I wished in either direction. One room leading off another. In that moment of far-reaching vision, I saw everything. Every last tiny detail from the glorious pipe organ that would line the wall of my bedchamber to the canopied coffin where I intended to sleep. There had to be a coffin. You see, because Garnier had been quite right, this place was my chosen tomb, a monument to my own insane genius. The Paris Opera was a pyramid in opulent disguise, and I, the pharaoh, would lie deep in its heart in the secret glory of my afterlife. The dream faded, like a wilted candle, leaving me once more in nothing more than a dark, damp hole. But I had seen the ultimate vision. It was months, years, away from my grasp, and yet nothing. Not even the might of the Prussian army should stand in the way of its fulfillment. The most fantastic house on this earth would be guarded by every device a magician's mind could conjure. I would never sleep above the surface of the ground again. If I had not made that decision when I did, I would have been arrested in the first week of the siege, when spy mania swept the city. Anyone who, in dress or manner, betrayed even the slightest difference from their fellow fellow men, and was denounced to the new Republican authorities as a suspected traitor. The deaf and the dumb were hounded without mercy, and even a stammer was sufficient to justify the spiteful persecution of the angry mob. A score of interesting men, who had fled from the enemy at Cobuva, were paraded through the city with their heads tied behind their backs with their hands tied behind their backs, bearing placards that invited honest folk to spit in their faces. The hysteria passed, spirits lifted, and Paris settled back to enjoy the novelty of a siege that no one expected to last for long. Viewing the fortifications became a pleasant family outing on Sunday afternoons, and while the re regiments drilled, the long benches in the champs Ulysses were full of gossiping citizens lulling in the sun. Guitars twanged, organs were ground, and merry-go-rounds won for a swing. People took opera glasses to study the Prussian batteries at Moudon, and the occasional puff of smoke from the gunboats was dismissed with light-hearted derision. Everyone knew that Paris was invincible. With her incentive wall, her ten-foot moat, and her lines of forts stretching over a circumference of forty miles, he presented a formidable front to any investing army. And the new government had not been idle. The catacombs had been sealed, elaborate barricades placed across the Seine, electrically fired landmines laid in weak spots. Paris was ready to face the worst the Moltec's vast army was prepared to offer. And the papers predicted that the Prussians would soon be slulking home in humiliated defeat. Four months later, when the shelling of civilian areas finally begun, the city had already been crippled by a harsh winter of increasing deprivation. The temperature had plummeted twelve degrees below zero. Men froze to death on duty at the outposts, and with the city's stocks of firewood virtually exhausted, desperate men and women fought over trees, felled telegraph poles, and threatened to flay the National Guard which stood on duty outside a wood depot in the Rue des Belles Fleurs. With the Prussian installed at Versailles, Paris starved beneath a merciless iron-gray sky. The left bank of the city shuddered each night beneath a, a rain of shells which set the streets on fire. On the roof of the opera house I saw columns of smoke rising in the still cold air beyond the Seine. 
Prussians were deliberately directing their fire at churches and hospitals. And as the batteries closed in around a city, any building flying the Red Cross of the Geneva Convention was automatically signaled out as a target. The Institute for the Insane, the Asylum for the Blind, the Hospital for Young Children, nothing was sacred anymore. I found it hard to believe that men could sink so low. The Opera House had been requisitioned as an arsenal and warehouse for vital food supplies. And I lived in perpetual terror of fire breaking out through someone's carelessness. One million liters of wine stood on the premises. And more than once I heard drunken car rousing echoing through the building. The Prussian batteries were not yet close enough to shell the right bank, but a single carelessly dropped cigarette was all it would take to blow the opera spout of magazine sky high. All the time that I worked alone on my secret house, my heart was full of dread. I never left the premises unguarded except for the few hours it took me once a fortnight to make my way to Jules' rented house on the left bank. There, in the dark, curtained room, pay the wages of men who would otherwise have starved for want of employment. All over the city, builders had been turned off government sites for the duration of the siege. The opera, the new Hotel Dieu, the 2,000 unfinished houses in the area of Hussman's redevelopment. I continued to pay the men in my employ without begrudging the few francs that might manage to earn elsewhere in the meantime. Food was rapidly becoming a prerogative of the rich. But no one who had worked for me at the opera was permitted to starve. The prices soared beyond their means. I simply raised their due to the level of living wage. I never looked at the men when they came into the room. I stood with my arms folded beneath my cloak and my face to the wall while they collected their envelopes in terrified silence and crept away. For the duration of my presence in the house, Madame Bernard and her little ones cowered out of sight in, the, in a bedroom. It was still possible to obtain morphine in return for an exorbitant sum and a great deal of patience. I always took care to pay Jules rather more than I owed him for his singular service and then leave without further delay. The ritual depressed me. and we longed to get away from the atmosphere of suppressed fear. It was better to be alone. By the seventeenth the week of the siege, Paris was on its knees. The butcher's stalls in the great central market were selling slaughtered cats decorated with paper frills and colored ribbons, and the rat market on the Place de l'Hôtel de Ville was besieged with desperate customers. The animals in the zoo at the Bois had been slaughtered so that the restaurants might serve elephant to those with the means to pay for the delicacy. Someone would most certainly have eaten Aisha if I had not found her first. I was wandering the streets aimlessly that night listening with indifference to the shells whining overhead like the howling of a high wind in autumn. There was no one around. Everyone with any sense in this area was lying low in a cellar out of harm's way. But I no longer cared whether I was blown to pieces by a Prussian bomb. A telling little incident at the Bernard house had virtually dulled the last of my fading appetite for life. All the men had gone. I had been settling up with jewels when... There was a scream in the hallway and the sound of something tumbling heavily down the stairs. Without thinking, I ran out into the narrow, ill-lit passage just as Madame Bernard reached the bottom step and snatched up the small child who whimpered at my feet. Clutching the little girl against her breast, she began to break away upstairs. Madam, the child is injured. Let me look at her. N no, she stammered, still edging backward up sort of stairs. No, monsieur, you're mistaken. It was nothing, just a little tumble, two or three steps, that's all, that's all. She was lying. The child had fallen down the full flight, and now lay white and unprotesting in her arms. I started up the stairs and was frozen by the woman's shriek of fear. Stay away from her, don't touch her. Madam. Why do you have to come here? She spat, suddenly rearing from terror to aggression. Frightening the children, frightening everyone. Why don't you keep away? Annette, gasped Jules in horror. Annette, for God's sake, be silent. We don't need your cold charity, she continued doggedly from the landing. We don't need your money. You won't buy my children as you have bought my husband. Go away, monsieur. Go right away and don't come back. Do you hear me? Don't ever come back here again. <laughs>
She turned and ran onto the landing, and almost at once a door slammed behind her on a room full of crying children. He came slowly back down the stairs to where Jules was waiting with both hands clutched against his thin chest. Monsieur, he whispered helplessly. Monsieur, I, I beg you to forgive my wife's outburst. She is not in her right senses. She meant no offense. She silenced him with a look and tossed two hundred francs onto the shabby hall table. Get that child to a doctor quickly, he said coldly, and walked out of the house. My heart was like a lump of lead dragging heavy in my breast as I made my way back through the squalid, snow-laden streets. On the bank of the Seine, as I paused to study the ice flows that were blocking the river, I heard a prostitute hail a passing soldier. Monsieur, I will take you to my room in exchange for a piece of bread. The man paused and spoke, but I could not hear his reply. Presently, they moved on together in the direction of the Rue de Grenelle. Staring out across the frozen river, I wondered briefly just how hungry a woman would have to be to accept bread from my hand in return for her services. I never dared to approach a prostitute. I had never been able to face the humiliation of having my money refused. The memory of that little slave girl in Persia still burned in my mind. Something pulled at the hem of my cloak. And as I turned, thinking to find the elegant cashmere snagged on the remains of a paling, I found that I, too, had been accosted by a lady desperate for food. A very little lady. There on the pavement, almost indistinguishable against the dirty snow, a cream kitten sat with the claws of her chocolate-colored paws entangled in the material. With a cry of disbelieving delight, I swept her up off the snow and examined her beneath the yellowish light of a gas lamp. She was caked with filth, but her breed was unmistakable as it was inconceivable. There were no Siamese cats in Europe, and yet I held one in my hands, a rare and precious jewel dropped from heaven into the landscape of hell. Of course, I knew she could not possibly have dropped from heaven. Some enterprising French traveler had evidently succeeded in smuggling a, a breeding female from the palace at Bangkok, knowing that the Empress Eugenie would be prepared to pay handsomely for such a unique animal. Everywhere, rich ladies would be clamoring for a similar novelty. No doubt the man had expected to make a fortune, but the Empress had fled, and the rich were now eating their fine-blooded racehorses. No one was interested in acquiring another mouth only in that little extra something for the cooking pot. Dead cats had become a fashionable substitute for flowers and sweets as a gift for a sick friend. Boiled cat, served pistachio nuts and olives, had become a delicacy for connoisseurs. I could well imagine the horrible end which had overtaken the mother and the rest of her litter. But this little creature was born to survive. I could see it in the irrepressible impetuousness of her cross blue eyes. Fate, which favors some against the longest odds, had brought her soliciting to a man who would have died of hunger before he separated her from her lovely pelt. Tucking her safely beneath my cloak, I hurried through the streets with fresh purpose in my step. Ayesha changed my life. Over fifteen thousand kilos of salted horse meat had been stored at the opera, and supplies were not yet entirely exhausted. I could not bring myself to consume horse flesh, but I stole for Aisha and stayed out of the room while she ate to control my revulsion. There were plenty of rats in the cellars, and within a few weeks she had lost the scragginess of starvation and grown sleek and contented. She followed me around the secret house like a puppy and sat beside me while I worked. I could not wait for the day when she would be big enough to wear the Persian collar. To see her strutting in its stolen magnificence would be a pleasure beyond imagination. She was my amusement, my joy, the chosen companion of my solitude. If there had been no horse meat and rats, she would have eaten human flesh. I would have killed, if necessary, to feed my precious, precious little lady. Nineteen weeks into the siege, the beleaguered government capitalized in an awesome, resentful science descended like a shroud around the city. The German troops marched down the Champs Elysees, and in their wake, the poor, who had borne the brunt of all the hardships, 
was summarily required by a reactionary assembly to pay all debts and rents, postponed for the duration of the siege within 48 hours, plunged into bankruptcy, and creeped by the immediate suppression of six newspapers. The lower classes rose in fury, and a new revolution rocked the city. The government fled to Versailles. The Commune of Paris was declared, and as the screaming mobs took the streets, the real horrors began. No longer was the madness of destruction confined to the left bank. The opera was seized by the National Guard, and the red flag of the Commune, which now flew from the roof, made the building a perfect target for Republican forces. More bombs screamed down on the battered city, but now there were French shells, shells of civil war. Soldiers swarmed all over the barricaded opera house, and there was vicious fighting in the streets outside. I had become a prisoner in my own home. To all intents and purposes, I was under house arrest, for I knew that if I showed myself, I would be shot on sight as a spy. Down into the cellars came the citizen generals with their pistols and their ridiculous red sashes, their cigarettes glowing in the darkness like tiny embers as they supervised the incarnation of political prisoners. The perfect silence was punctuated by their crude oaths and rakish laughter. I hated these cruel intruders shepherding their victims down to the Khmer dungeon below the fifth cellar. I hated them all. National Guardsmen and Republicans alike. Fools. They were fools.